Hi, everybody. Welcome to UCLA Connections. I uh, hope you're doing well and taking care of yourselves and others. Today, we're going to talk about morals and ethics in our current state of affairs. So super light topic, super uh, snacky. Um, we got a lot of great questions for this topic, and we know that so many people are dealing with very real situations and real, um, very specific moral and ethical quandaries right now. But we're really fortunate to have with us today one of our philosophers from campus. So we're going to talk about those things in a more abstract philosophical context. And we're very grateful to have Pamela Hieronymi with us. She's been teaching in the UCLA Department of Philosophy since 2000, and she teaches about and writes about ethics, moral responsibility, and free will, all very important topics right now. And over the last couple of years, Pam's also had a really interesting opportunity to think a little differently about how to talk about moral philosophy as one of the... Uh, uh, one of the contributors to The Good Place. She was a philosophical uh, consultant on the hit TV show. And actually, we have a photo. She got to appear in a cameo on the final episode with uh, Kristen Bell and all the rest of the cast. So that's Pam there in the pink next to Kristen Bell. Uh, they're taking a philosophy class together. So thank you so much, Pam, for being with us and talking about this weighty topic with us today. Thank you. Yeah, it's Hi. great to be here. <laughs> so you and I have talked uh, a couple of times over the years about the good place, and I thought we thought one of the one of the the philosophical concepts that came up in that show was this theory of contractualism, or, and we th I thought that would be a great way to kind of start our conversation because it feels very mm, appropriate to the the mm -hmm. moment that we're in. So. Can you tell, can you just explain a little about what contractualism is? Sure, so contractualism is a theory about what it is for an action to be wrong. Uh, and it's contrasts with utilitarianism, which says what it is for an action to be wrong depends just on its consequences. Um, and it contrasts with some other theories. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a minimal theory of moral, uh, of, of morality. So it's not about what it is to be a fully virtuous person or a great person. It's about the, the minimum standards you need to meet to be respectful. And, uh, and the, the way you think about those, according to the contractualist, is that you um, imagine that everyone affected by, uh, by, by your actions uh, has gotten together and is in a kind of um, constitutional convention. So everyone has gotten together and is trying to decide the rules by which we will then go on and live our lives and constrain our own pursuits um, so that we can share a world together peacefully. Um, and uh, we need to come to agreement. We need unanimity on this. It's not majority rule. And no one has a bargaining advantage. Everyone is symmetrically situated. And the <laughs> most important thing is to come to some agreement. Mm -hmm. So the thought is that the moral rules, the minimum rules of respectfully sharing a world together are the rules we would agree to in that situation when the most important thing is to come to some agreement, everyone has a veto, and no one has um, the ability to exploit or overpower anybody. And then the thought is that what it is to be moral or respectful is to live according to those rules or principles, even when we're not equally powerful, even when some people do have an advantage. So the idea is like, how do we share a world together peacefully? How do we share a world together with other people, treating them as equal to us, treating them as having the same dignity and the thought is, well, think about what we could all agree to and then constrain your pursuits in accordance with that. It's that tension between free will and responsibility to the other. Is mm -hmm. that appropriate? Yeah, it's, so contractualism as a moral theory is an inheritor of social contract theory as a political theory. And social contract theory as a political theory is, is liberalism, which is based on freedom. Um, and so it's, 
it's the, it's the maximum freedom of each consistent with the freedom of all. Mm. And so it's that same idea, the maximum freedom of each until you start running into other people. Yeah. And so now how can we as equals constrain our pursuits uh, as little as possible, but also without disrespecting others? Yeah. Kind of like what we're facing now. Um, just wearing a mask isn't about protecting yourself. It's about protecting the community or staying right. six feet apart isn't necessarily about ensuring your own safety, but ensuring the safety of all. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things I really loved about The Good Place is the way they got to it was um, from the title of the book, the philosophical book, What We Owe to Each Other. Right. I think that's a very beautiful phrase to think about. Yeah, maybe I don't want to wear a mask. Or maybe I'm not so worried about my own health, but I do worry about what I owe to others who I don't know what their circumstances are, or if they're immunocompromised. Is that kind of framing something that maybe we can all inhabit a little bit as we navigate this new reality? Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, and there's a way in which it's, it's the standard, uh, what if everybody did that? Or what would you want in somebody else's shoes, right? Those are the everyday ways of, of expressing the idea. Um, and so contractualism just makes it a little more formal and a little more, um, it, it makes you think at the level of general principles and rules. But if you think about general principles and rules and you give everyone a veto and some people are saying, I don't wanna wear a mask, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, I can't express myself through it. Those are, those are real reasons, those are good reasons. But if somebody else says, people need to wear masks because it puts my life at risk, I'm, I'm especially um, vulnerable to this, that's a better reason, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so if we need to come to agreement um, and we treat everyone symmetrically, you know, the person with the weightier concern is going to, is going to carry the day. Right. Now, there's, there's other, um, I mean, the, the, the rule will be complex, because there's gonna be other people for whom wearing a mask is itself a real danger. Right. right? And so then there's gonna be exceptions to be made. But if it's just about comfort mm -hmm. on the one hand and, um, and real risk to life on the other, then, then that's, not a hard, that's not a hard thing to see. Yeah, or if it's just kind of an existential resistance to the symbolism of it, like that's not as valid as the argument that it actually is protective of the whole so uh, so it's not I, I wouldn't want to say that that symbolism can't play a role as a reason right I, I, because there are situations in which it does there are situations in which the fact that something is casting me as um as an outsider say mm -hmm. has a symbolism then, then then that that can be very serious um but in this case um you know it, it we're just working out a new social norm. Mm -hmm. And whenever that happens, I mean, you can think about seatbelts from a long time right. ago, right? Whenever that happens, there is a certain amount of resistance. There is a certain amount of don't tell me what to do. And you're, you know, you're on my, you're getting on my, um, you're getting into my space. You're getting into my space of my freedom and my autonomy. Um, and sometimes that's true, right? So, 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 so that it's not that that's um, in principle a bad, argument mm -hmm. but contractualism lets you think about it like as okay so we're looking for the maximum freedom of each consistent with the freedom of all the maximum freedom of each to pursue their interests consistent with respect for other people's interests right and so if you think about it that way that particular um objection seems not compelling right and it's also, you know, in the circumstances that we find ourselves, the mac our maximum freedom of movement and economic behavior and shopping and dining together, that might require a little bit of contracting of the individual. You mm -hmm. know, we want the maximum right. for ourselves and for others, but that just means we take a little extra care mm -hmm. with ourselves and for others. Yes. Um, but you're right, like I was looking back, um, I was thinking about it and every, you know, seat belts and car seats. I mean, every, mm -hmm. everything that's been mandated has also come with resistance. So we're, mm -hmm. 
whatever moment in time we're having, uh, we are coming by it absolutely honestly and predictably mm -hmm. in a way. Yep. <laughs> so I know a lot of people get really, there's a, I feel like there's varying degrees of tension around how to be out in the world right now. I have some friends who are not that worried. I have other friends who say, I can't even go for a walk because people in my neighborhood don't wear masks. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're just like, okay, then I just change my behavior a little bit. And others get very frustrated. Uh, so we had some questions come in about this. Is there an opportunity to inspire rather than blame people to, you know, be curious rather than frustrated? Or how does that work from a philosophical perspective? Um, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, certainly there are opportunities to inspire rather than blame. Um, I'm not sure there's a ton of, um, so I'm not sure my answer will be particularly philosophical. That's okay. Um, but, uh, but I mean, one of the things that I saw in my neighborhood social media next door thing was somebody just thanking people for wearing masks. I thought that was very nice and a good approach. Um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, humans are extremely defensive creatures. <laughs> so, so, um, so blaming people is, is, uh, not a, is typically not a terribly effective method, at least if you're, um, if you're on a one-on-one -on -one kind of confrontation. Um, but um, by wearing a mask yourself, by thanking people, by, by presuming the best of people in your interactions with them, um, I mean, if you, you might, depending on your financial means, you might have an extra mask and offer it to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of my favorite philosophers on this kind of issue uh, is Miss Manners. Uh, mm -hmm. And Miss Manners' general um, MO is to say, is to think, as you approach confrontation with others, always assume the best of them. You know, kind of even if your evidence is that that's probably not a good assumption, she thinks mm -hmm. that's, that's the right way to enter the conversation. And I, and I think that's good advice. Yeah. I think also, you know, we can do a lot with our, our body language. You know, I'm not walking around. I admit, if I'm just taking a walk in my neighborhood, I don't have a mask on my face. I have it on me, mm -hmm. but I will tend to put it on if I come close to someone. And mm -hmm. that is my signal to them that I, I see you wearing your mask and I, I'm, sure. I'm trying to care. Um, sure. Uh, so and like or just like it's hard because we can't no one can see you smiling or no one can understand right. like that you're 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 fine so how do we find our little mannerisms that show one another like mm -hmm. you know hey great or like no right. no worries you know if you're wearing right. mask and sunglasses you're basically you yeah. know an android for yeah. uh, from a body language perspective or right so it's a lot to navigate it's fine that it's a lot. i think it's really uh, you know, for me, it's just about trying to be more curious and empathetic than, you know, frustrated and blamey. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that I think we all, one thing we're all, we're all also coping with, like, even if we were doing a little better at the collective agreement, even if that was happening and and we all felt a little more calm about the collective agreement on some of the, the behaviors we're being asked to in, in, you know, perform. We also know that there are some who won't in every situation. There are some who just never will wear a seatbelt or you know, there are some mm -hmm. who won't. And um, that's, uh, that's a part of contractualism too, or understanding that there are some who just won't, right? Mm -hmm. Um, well, so it's a thing that contractualism um, allows you to understand a little bit, a little bit better, because um, there are cases in which people fail to comply, in which um, the actual effects of the, them failing to comply is not are not that great. So if you were a utilitarian and you're always looking at the consequences, you're not going to capture quite how how um, how upsetting these cases are. So, um, so these get called free rider cases. So anytime you have a collective problem that needs a kind of collective solution, um, anytime is strong, but often there's going to be the possibility 
that a couple people don't need to comply and the solution will still hold, so to speak. So they, that's called free rider. You can think of a subway system, public transportation. If um, that needs to be funded, we have fares to fund that. But if, if a couple people jump the turnstile and don't pay the fare, trains yeah. still run. Crashing right? down, yeah. <laughs> um, now, the mask case isn't quite there yet. I mean, we're really, feels to me like we're at more of a, a cusp moment of whether there's, there's enough people who are doing it to make it even work at all. Um, but if we imagined a world in which almost everyone was wearing a mask, um, then if a few people don't wear a mask, you know, that's not going to, that's not going to bring the system crashing down. Similarly with vac vaccines, right? When everyone's vaccinated, um, then if your child isn't vaccinated, they're safe because everyone else is. Yeah. But if, um, if, if everyone were to do that, there's that, what if everyone did it, right? If everyone were to do that, then um, you wouldn't be safe. And so the, the really mundane um, version of this uh, here in Los Angeles is when people uh, cut in line off the freeway at the very last minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, there are reasons for, for cutting in line off the last minute, like if you're trying to get rushed to the hospital, for example. Um, but most people who do that, I suspect, I'm, I'm, I'm um, not following Miss Manners uh, uh, advice now, but most people I suspect are doing it because it's not a good time to wait in line, mm -hmm. right? But it's not, nobody thinks it's a good time to wait in line. Nobody thinks that's a good idea, right? So by cutting in line, what they're saying is, um, I'm special, right? Right. Like I get to make an exception of myself. Um, we have this system that will, will um, solve our problem. But I can, I can make the exception. I can be the special person. And what's interesting about that from, at least one thing that's interesting about that from a philosophical point of view is that the actual damage that person does is pretty minimal. I mean, they, they, maybe they take 45 seconds of my day, right? Mm -hmm. But it it's, it's, makes me angry, right? Because what they're saying about the rest of us, you know, they're saying about the rest of us, you you do the um the conforming right and and i'll get the benefit of it yeah right? um and so so that kind of free rider problem um is um is is one that i think so so i have a, a friend and colleague at irvine who has a book called assholes a theory mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a which uh is about people who make an exception of themselves in this way he calls them assholes and and he in the towards the end of that book he actually um, argues that our society is cre is creating more and more people who think that that's an okay way to be so so that's an interesting hypothesis. Right. It's and, like um, light is red except for Mike, not me because I don't do that. But my husband, I he's one of those that'll scoot right on up to the front of the line, and I can guarantee he's never been to get to the hospital it's just because he. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the, I mean, that's the rub, right? That's the thing as like thinking and, you know, learning humans is to how do we, how do we cope with that? Is that guy going to ruin your whole day? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just, you get to choose some of that too. So is the person you know who's not wearing a mask if they're not like on top of you and spitting in your face like maybe you get to choose that they don't get to you know have an effect on the rest of your day or your life or your thinking about the world you know there is a lot of personal responsibility in in how we respond to those who don't behave the way that we might ourselves so I agree, though I also think that, um, and this is a point that James makes in, in his book, um, that being angry about that is, is a way of, um, of affirming your own value. Mm -hmm. so, so that um, if you weren't angry about it, um, that might feel to you, might not, but it might feel to you like not recognizing mm -hmm. yourself. Um, but I agree that there's a, my own, my own, the thing that goes through my mind that I've, uh, as people cut off, cut in front of me off the freeway, is a is a scene from The Matrix 
when um, Neo has been out um, partying and he's being chastised by his boss behind this massive desk in this empty room with the window cleaners happening. And the boss says, Mr. Anderson, you think you're special. You think the rules do not apply to you. And that's what goes through my head when people do that. I think you yeah. think you're special. <laughs> I think also, you know, our responses are so, dic are always going to be dictated by kind of the moment that we're in, you know, and some days maybe you're more in a state of being where you're more apt to be able to just say, oh God, you know, that guy clearly has a thing to do or just doesn't want to be mm -hmm. part of the solution right now and that's fine. And then other days, if you've had a lot of tension or you know, whatever's going on in your own individual life might affect your ability to manage those responses both right. in the moment and, and after. It's right. hard. It's hard to know because I, I, I don't know what, I don't know, and I don't want to make any, I don't want to ask you to make any behavioral prescriptions because you're a philosopher, not a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very hard to know where that line is to ask someone to do something that they're not doing, especially if they're a stranger. It's mm -hmm. different if they're your friend or your family member. And mm -hmm. you know, like I'm going to see my sisters next weekend and we've all collectively decided we're getting COVID tested first mm -hmm. and, and we'll just, we're doing that for each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then but that's like the choice that we made together. But I felt very comfortable asking them to do that because they're my mm -hmm. sisters. Right. I don't know. How do you ask? How, I mean, again, I'm not asking you to make a prescription. Mm -hmm. but I think maybe it, people can take some comfort in the in the idea that we're all kind of living in this liminal space about it. Like, right. you know, there are people who want to yell at others because they are wearing a mask and maybe they're mm -hmm. holding back from doing that. So. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so, I mean, the, again, the mask question and, and a lot of other ethical questions are not these free rider problems. The free rider problems sort of isolate very purely this idea of, of standing and status and respect. But a lot of these problems are ones that do have very serious consequences for people, you know, for certain people. And, um, and, and one thing to be said is um, rather than um, you're terrible, you're bad, um, you know, I, it's important to me right, mm -hmm. that, that, you, that you do this, or I'm more comfortable if you do this, right? That's another, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, remembering the, um, the town halls that happened when Obamacare was on the chopping block, and that the number of people standing up you know, face to face with their representative and saying, what are you going to say to me? Right. Because here's what I'm facing personally. And, and I think like being really personal about that, that's, that's a lot more vulnerable and a lot more difficult than just accusing somebody. But I think it's also a lot more um, authentic and effective. Yeah. And well, I mean, well, it's all about, well, vulnerability like mm -hmm. recognizing the vulnerable state of our society right now in every on every level and also just being willing to be a little bit vulnerable yourself like mm -hmm. it might to some it might be vulnerable to wear a mask mm -hmm. to others it's vulnerable to wear it um and to tell maybe to tell other people why they wear it mm -hmm. you know and i don't know communication mm -hmm. is is critical mm -hmm. and it doesn't really usually come from yelling or accusing in, mm -hmm. in my experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, big questions. A lot will change. I think some of what we're coping with also right now is just so much uncertainty, you mm -hmm. know, even uh, scientifically, scientific uncertainty. Um, mm -hmm. There's been this whole, the whole, especially the mask question has been a moving target because in the early days, we were told don't wear a mask, you know, it didn't even help or mm -hmm. we need to save those for healthcare workers. So I have a lot of empathy for anyone who's coping with these kind of whiplash moments of scientific discovery. I mean, this right. has only been in our life for a few months. Right. We're still learning so much. And it's concerning to me a little bit when, um, when people respond to the fact that uh, a 
that, that we're getting changing directives by mm -hmm. thinking, um, oh, that means this whole thing is, is illegitimate or they don't know what they're talking about. Um, because that's exactly the fact that we will update in light of new information, mm -hmm. right, is exactly the legitimacy of the scientific um, process. Right. Um, you know, and like you say, this is brand new. I mean, we're, we need to learn. I, I mean, it does seem like we're learning that, that airborne transmission is the, is the main kind of transmission. That's really helpful to know. That really helps us know where to focus our efforts in trying to um, reestablish, I won't say normal because I don't think normal is happening, but um, in trying to reestablish um, some activities <laughs> that we would like to participate in. Um, uh, you know, it, it would be nice if, if it weren't airborne, that would be different and it might be easier right. in some ways and harder in others. But, but anyway, as we get more information, it, it, it can only help us. Yeah, agreed. And, and who knows? Two months, we might be having an entirely different conversation about it. So we just have to stay open and kind of caring about one another and maybe thinking a little more um, philosophically about the way we, we cope. And thank you so much for diving into it with us. I know it's kind of a heavy thing to, to get into. Um, uh, we have, some, we have a, a page with some links to some other resources if you're interested in hearing more about some of these philosophical ideas. Pam actually has done a, a, a lot of media around the good place. So there's a lot of really good articles podcasts, uh, uh, video interviews, where they, where she talks with the creator of The Good Place and one of her fellow consultants about, you know, how that show came to be and what, you know, what we've learned from that show about uh, philosophy and moral responsibility. So thank you so much for watching. We're really grateful to be back at it and hope that you're all taking care of one another and taking care of yourselves. And this conversation will be up at ucla.edu slash connections and so you can rewatch anytime. Thanks.